Because when you get married and you see what happens is that at half past five in the afternoon you get a call and you get told, um, could you please report to 37th Street? And of course there, there had been some rumors beforehand that you might expect the call. But you know, some people hear these rumors but the call doesn't come. <laughs> And so I jumped into my car and I drove to 37th Street. And when you get to 37th Street, there is a place where normal people go, and then there's a place where ABCs come. And uh, the people came up, and I was way up there. And you go into this room, and in the room are 10 other people. Whom you know, um, some are MECs or were MECs in the previous term, and some weren't. And you all sit in the room, and you get called upstairs one by one. And the ones who go up never come back. <laughs> <laughs> so, what you don't know is, and of course, what you're doing in there, when, when you come in, they take your phones away. That's the first thing they do, they take your phones away. So you can't do any intelligence gathering operation. You can't phone the ones who've never come back and say, did you get rehired, what did you get? Nothing, okay? So you don't know as they go through the process, and it takes time. So by the time I went, and I mean, I've been there since half past five, by the time I went up on it, was about 11.30 at night. Okay, and you are tense. Um, and in pretty much those times, it was kind of a good check, you know, there was a couple of cases of one. <laughs> and as you sat there, you came to understand what these cases of one were for. Um, unfortunately, that was one bad thing that Prima Mokunyan did, was when we were appointed that time, there was no one. Anyway, so you go upstairs and you go into this room up on the 16th floor and the Premier is there and the Provincial Secretary of the ANC is there and the Director General of the Province is there and they sit on one side of the table and you sit on the other. And the Premier says, um, yes, Barbara, uh, we've decided to appoint you as the MEC for Sports, Arts and Culture and um, as you know, um, this is the run up to 2010, so you'll just sort out everything for 2010. Lovely, lovely to see you. Thank you very much for coming. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and you go outside. And as you go outside, the GG nips outside and he says, MC this way. And you get taken through another door. So you can't even see the one who's coming next to say. <laughs> <laughs> They know that that one is gone. And they take you downstairs and they say, right, official photographs. Smile. And I mean, you are in shock. You are in complete <laughs> shock. And now you must smile. So that terrible picture of you on the night of the appointment, which most of you have in your schools. <laughs> now you know why I look the way that I look. You know, all of this has just happened. Anyway, so I go home and um, my kids are, are awake and you get told you're not allowed to tell anybody. And you go downstairs and they take your car keys away and you get issued with two gentlemen who from now on drive you and you sit in the back of your own car which you drove there and <laughs> They come every morning and they've got this program. And they say, Good morning, MEC. And you say, Good morning. They open the back door and you get in the back door. And then they say, They don't say anything. They drive to what's on the program. So, and that's how it is every day. It's been like that every day for nine and a bit years. <laughs> but that I had, I had played. Many, I had had many roles in political life that, that had responsibility, but I've never been, I've never been the boss before. 
In my first week as the MC for Arts and Culture, Brenda Fassi passed on. And the very first public engagement I had was I had to go to the hospital where she was lying, at that stage already on life support. And I get taken in there and, uh, you know, for a comfort with family and so on. And I get told when I'm in there, look, she's on life support. The family can't take the decision to do what is required. And when you go out there to talk to the media, you can't tell them that she's on life support. So I say, okay. I've never done a media interview in my life. And I walk out of that hospital into this bag of television cameras and it was seen about the red fuck, how's the red fuck? As South Africans, I think we must all pray for Brenda Fassi. <laughs> that was my first engagement. And it, the, the three weeks after that, we won the Bird to host the World Cup. And I was the only sports government official in South Africa. Everybody else was in Geneva. And it was the same thing. This bank of television cameras, a little me who'd been in the job for three weeks and who knew nothing about 2010, absolutely nothing. Um, and now we have the ABC from South Africa, who will be being live across the world on the ABC. <laughs> anyway, within a month, I was, I was in a terrible state. And I used to do this thing at night, which I called staring at the wall. So I would go home and I would stare at the wall. <laughs> And the reason I did that was because at long last nobody was talking to me, nobody was demanding anything of me, nobody was asking me to leave, nobody was bringing me their problems, and I could stare at the wall. And my son, who was 10 years old at the time, chirps up one right evening, So, Mum, now that you've got what you've always been waiting for, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> conversation that night that made me realize that I was in a complete crisis and that in fact I was going to implode. I, I, I couldn't deal with this. And the thing that was hardest was I couldn't understand why I couldn't deal with it. Because there was nothing technically speaking that I couldn't do. But emotionally I couldn't deal with it. And the next day I phoned one of my colleagues who still is a good friend of mine, but who had been in MEC already by that stage for two terms. And I said to him, I can't go. I don't know what to do. And he said, okay, come and have coffee. And he gave me some advice. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because when you land up in that position, the most important thing for you in that time is to have a critical threat. Someone to whom you can actually say, I can't do this. Because you cannot go to the team and say, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I, I, I'm scared of these TV cameras. I'm scared of these journalists to come and put microphones under my nose. I'm scared of these officials who come with piles and piles of files and said to me, these are the submissions that you see you must sign. And you don't know, should I sign it, should I not sign it? And there are all these decisions that you have to make. And what you start to do is to postpone making decisions because you're not sure which decision you should take. And you, you know that there are unintended consequences, but you don't know what they are. And the truth of the matter is that being in leadership is it's about taking decisions, often very hard decisions that will have personal consequences for you, unpleasant personal consequences. It's about motivating the team, rallying the troops. It's about dealing with the taxi drivers and you know we've got interesting things like teaching unions in education. Um, <laughs> It's about parents. And I think that although being a principal 
might, on the surface of it, seem to be a fairly simple leadership job. It's actually a very, very complicated leadership job. And it has many of the facets that quite senior leadership jobs have because it involves not just dealing with one set of problems and one set of issues. It actually has a very multifaceted role. And I can tell you, having been in the for education, that our principles are right at the very heart of our schooling system. The huge turnaround strategy that we are implementing in the department will stand or fall on the basis of those individuals. So we can have the heart and primary literacy and math strategy which we're implementing in 800 schools and the senior secondary school improvement strategy that we're implementing in 400 schools. But if those individual principles can't lead and can't deal with the daily complexities that their job throws up, those strategies won't really work. Or they will work in the sense that they are running parallel to the school leadership and the school management. But interventions on that scale can't be there forever. As a department, we are spending a billion and a half rand per annum on these interventions. We can't do it forever. The only way in which these schools will really change permanently is if the leaders in them are able to say, we understand what the department is trying to do with these turnaround strategies, we like them, we're going to grab them, and we're going to start to, to implement them ourselves and to achieve what we call achieving the change into the system. So we won't have coaches forever for, for our primary school teachers. They've got to be able to teach reading and writing and arithmetic themselves. And our principals and our deputy principals and our heads of department and our district officials have to be able to play the role that those coaches are playing at the moment. But they can only do it with the very significant help that I think your organization is giving them. And I've been inspired by the stories that I've heard tonight. I've been inspired by the way in which the principals have been inspired, and I've been inspired by the way in which those who are helping have been inspired. And I really think that this is a, a wonderful program that can contribute a very good, great deal to the work that we're doing to turn around our education system. What we can say to you as those who are already involved and those who would like to get involved is that our department is deeply committed to turning around the education of our province. We can't do this job on our own. Half the schools in this province are what we call priority schools. They are schools that are battling to produce learners at the level that our society our economy, our future demands. And we can't do it on our own. So, I would like to, to have a meeting with you where we can talk about how we make ourselves more user friendly to the partnership. Uh, but I would also like to motivate those of you who've come along tonight to look and see, to say, come on board. It's an incredibly worthwhile activity. In conclusion, let me say to you that before I became a C for education, one of the things I could never understand <coughs> was why the former MECs for education found it very hard to break their addiction for the department. And I've discovered why. Because very soon when my term is over, I'll also become a problem and a rehabil uh, an unrehabilitated addict. <laughs> when times are hard, and they're often hard in this job, when the problems get too enormous, there's something I do now. I 
go to schools and I interact with the children. And when I do that, it's all worthwhile. Because they have so much life in them, so much energy, so much potential. And it makes me realize that there is nothing better that you can give at least some of your time and some of your life to, other than these children, who after all are our futures. Thank you very much.